This is Hidden Brain. I'm Shankar Vedantam. Seemingly every other month, we hear about the latest example of a thousand-year flood, a hundred-year hurricane, the once-in-a-lifetime forest fire. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. The road is on fire. Fire in Oregon, just one of 70 wildfires raging across 12 states. Portland, 116 degrees. That is a new all-time record. I mean, we've never seen anything like this in the Pacific Northwest. Historic and catastrophic flooding in Western Europe with at least 199 people killed and hundreds more still missing after violent... Experts have attributed the extreme weather to climate change. And here is former Vice President Al Gore. This is our generation's life or death battle. Think back through the histories of the cities represented here and the nations they are found in. Times in the past where heroism made the difference in a crucial battle that defined history. The whole world is facing just those circumstances right now. By now, we have grown accustomed to thinking of climate change as the enemy we must urgently defeat. Year after year, policymakers tell us it is our last and final chance to overcome the crisis. In my view, we've already waited too long to deal with this climate crisis. We can't wait any longer. The implication here is that while it is late, it is not too late to head off catastrophe. But in many parts of the world, this is no longer true. When we talk about climate change, we often talk about it as a battle. If we win this battle we get to avoid catastrophe. If we lose the battle, we're finished. Now, some battles are like that, but others are not. Today, we start with an account of two actual battles which illustrate two strategies for how we might respond to the huge challenge posed by climate change. Both battles represented crucial moments during the Second World War, but they could not be more different in terms of strategy, tactics, and philosophy. I want you to keep the stories of Dunkirk and Normandy in mind as you listen to the rest of the story. In strategy and philosophy, these battles are metaphors for two very different ways we might confront climate change. One version of the climate change story says if we marshal all of our effort and resources and fight with unity and determination, we can overcome a terrible foe and win. This story says we are at Normandy. Many activists like the rousing language of Normandy because stories of victory and defeat exhort people to action. But another version of the climate change story says we are not at Normandy. We are at Dunkirk. If we want to survive, we need to be realistic about what we are up against and consider what is feasible. Defeating the Nazis at Dunkirk was not feasible. The only option was to figure out how to retreat and save as many lives as possible. So in the struggle against climate change, which metaphor is more fitting? Is victory around the corner if we just try hard enough? Or should we accept a conditional defeat in the service of long-term survival? When I ask myself these questions, I know what I want to hear. I want to hear that victory is possible, that if we work hard enough, we can head off catastrophe. My name is Christina Hill, and I'm a professor at the uh, University of California at Berkeley and I teach in environmental planning and urban design. Christina specializes in one of the most visible aspects of climate change, and the topic we'll be mostly focusing on today, sea level rise. She says the oceans are predicted to go up at least three feet over the next 80 years. How likely is that extreme scenario? It can be hard to predict, but estimates range from 1 in 50 to 1 in 200. That's right. So at high tides in Norfolk, Virginia, Miami Beach, the Florida Keys, um, here in the San Francisco Bay, New York City, people are seeing water come up through storm drains that were designed to take water away, but are now letting water literally bubble up like in a fountain. I mean, it's, it sort of sounds like science fiction almost. I mean, of sort of the, <laughs> the, the monster coming up through the sewers feels like it's a Hollywood trope here. It kind of should be called, it came from below. Flooding, to state the obvious, is only one of the consequences of climate change. In recent months, we've seen other effects. Hurricanes, forest fires, extreme swings in weather. Climate change must be fought. This is our nuclear moment. In the language of climate science, this approach is known as mitigation. Do everything you can 
to head off climate change. But the most disturbing part of my conversation with Christina was not her account of what could happen if we failed to act. It was her account of what would happen even if we acted. Sea level rise, for example, is now projected to happen even if we stopped every molecule of, of CO2 from leaving human activities and livestock today. So sea level rise is now, you know, the horse that left the barn. It's going to happen anyway. The first thing to do when you're in a hole is to stop digging. And the, the analogy with climate change would be the first thing to do is to not make the problem any worse than it is right now. So wh why is it that stopping the emissions of greenhouse gases, why would it not head off these, uh, e even the moderate scenarios of, of sea level rise? Well, the oceans have absorbed most of the CO2 that we've emitted so far over the last two, 300 years. So we're seeing change just based on our 300 years of making this mistake. And we're also seeing um, tipping points and melting that can't be arrested just by stopping our CO2 emissions because there already is so much CO2. So this really speaks to sort of the inertia of the system, does it not? That's right. I mean, we're trying to catch up. We've learned about what our mistake was over the last 300 years, but it's already had consequences. We have to recognize that these systems have already changed. I mean, it seems a little scary in some ways when you think that there's still sort of debates, ongoing debates about whether climate change is real. And you're basically saying, you know, at this point, many of the effects of climate change are almost inevitable. Yeah, baked in on our new planet that we already live on. This kind of talk runs against so much of what we hear when it comes to fighting climate change. We are usually told we are at Normandy, that there is a way to defeat Hitler. Christina is saying... No, we are at Dunkirk. We may not like the reality we confront, but we have to be realistic about it. We have to prepare for that reality, what's known as adaptation. Now, it's worth noting that this type of thinking can be dispiriting. If we accept that some aspects of climate change are here to stay, will that make some people throw up their hands and give up? Will governments backpedal on even the meager promises they have made to rein in carbon emissions? Our country will not exist. You're listening to Hidden Brain. I'm Shankar Vedantam. This is Hidden Brain. I'm Shankar Vedantam. When we think about the effects of climate change, it can be hard to anticipate all the risks we may face in the coming decades. But as the author William Gibson once said, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. I'm standing in the future right now. Shallow water laps at my feet. And over the last several years, that is exactly what they have started to do. Yeah. All right, so just describe where we are right now, Hassan. Just describe what so, we're seeing around us and where we are. Right. We're, we're on an island which is uh, in the midst of being uh, reclaimed right now. Hassan and I are standing on a small oval spit of land. All around are huge, hulking ships with heavy machinery aboard. We visited the island on a holiday, so the machines were silent. But Hassan explained what they were here to do. So we've got uh, excavators, dredgers, we've got a lot of rock boulders which will, which will eventually uh, create shore protection for the island. This particular um, island used to be a sandbank, which we have sort of enhanced through dredging. The machine that I'm seeing over there, that's a dredger? That's a dredger. That's a dredger with uh, sort of the dredger is on top, uh, on, the, on the front of the vehicle and, and you put that down and uh, it churns the sand and uh, dredges sand plus water uh, through those pipes onto the island. We're trying to create a, an island eventually. Which will be We're trying to create an island. Hassan is literally extracting land from the sea. Um, again, this is not a natural island. We're reclaiming in an, in a, in an area where naturally it may have taken hundreds of years for an island to form, but we're, we're trying to do it within four or five months. So we, I, it's either we live on floating structures uh, in, in the ocean or we dredge and we create land uh, above uh, the sea level. That's what's happening right now. And so I'm, I'm guessing I, I, we're sort of walking around now to the, about the middle of the island, yeah. and I'm guessing we're probably about maybe three feet above Sea water, sea level? Two meters. Oh, it's actually two meters. Yeah, two meters above uh, sea level. Okay, but the whole thing right now is sand. whole thing right now is sand, yeah. The whole thing is built on sand. The sand is uh, strong enough to have buildings on it. 
They need to be realistic to stay one step ahead of the sea. As I heard Hassan's story, there was a part of me that said, OK, you can outrun the ocean for a year or a decade. But can you outrun it forever? That's when we come back. You're listening to Hidden Brain. I'm Shankar Vedantam. This is Hidden Brain. I'm Shankar Vedantam. In places like the Maldives, people have recognized they are not at Normandy. If sea level rises, let's say, three feet, then a lot of the Bay Area shoreline would be inundated. And if it was just the horizontal movement of that salt water, we would build dikes and prevent it from moving laterally. But unfortunately, it's also groundwater. So we have to be able to drain stormwater, and we have to be able to accommodate higher groundwater. I think we really should think about living with it in ways that are productive and safe instead of trying to keep it out. So this is fascinating what, what you're saying, because in some ways you're, you're saying sort of the metaphor in some ways of, of believing that we can overcome this foe, that might be sort of the wrong metaphor, that in some ways that battle might almost have been lost already. That's right. And the ocean has been rising for the last 22,000 years. We just have been in a slow period. We invented this whole city thing during the last 8,000 years when sea level rise has been very slow. So it can go really quickly. And we are concerned that in their new phase, it may go faster than it ever has in the last 20,000 years. We could be at the steepest part of the curve. So um, the idea of fighting that as if it's a war and you're keeping the enemy out, the Dutch used to think of it that way and try to guarantee safety to their citizens by keeping all of the seawater out, protecting them from all storm floods. But even the Dutch have said, well, you know what, maybe that's not realistic and we need to figure out how to live with water. And that's become the slogan of the Dutch effort to adapt is living with water, doing more floating housing, more artificial ponds that kind of make room for water and allow people to live around and even on the water. Adaptation is going to be very difficult and very expensive. And at a deeper level, retreat calls on us to accept that there might be towns and cities we cannot save. Yes, there may be population centers we can protect with levees and pumps. There may be fortifications we can build to guard against storms. But adaptation might mean there are some areas that cannot be saved. Which politician is willing to tell her constituents it's time to pull up stakes and run? In the United States, we don't really allow even grief. So how do you imagine the losses of land and you know, places that our parents lived and that we've always imagined living in, we wanted our children to live in. There's a lot of grief in that, and grief isn't really accepted in American culture. Yet, if we fail to do that psychological work, if we fail to talk honestly about what can and cannot be done, if we fail to be realistic about our options, Christina warns that natural disasters will not be the only things keeping us up at night. Unless we come up with ways to adapt in place in a way that gives us some stability for, let's say, 30 to 50 years at a time, then we create tens of millions of climate refugees, maybe hundreds of millions. And that, I think, means international conflict. That means war. So I, I think it's better to imagine adapting in place and reducing our CO2 than it is to imagine either the deaths or the migrations of tens of millions of people, that's unacceptable. Rather than deny what is inevitable, seeing climate change realistically might allow us to harness ingenuity and innovation. How can we thrive? With what agreements, with what physical systems? How do we look forward to a culture where people can be creative and happy and enjoy living with water? Water is beautiful. It's really about believing that there's going to be a way where we can have compassion for each other and we can be resourceful. We can be more resourceful together than alone. And we can be brave. We've used the frames of Dunkirk and Normandy in this story to make a point. The world is not focused remotely enough on the challenge of adaptation. To the extent we focus on adaptation, we are usually reactive. We think about adaptation after the hurricane strikes, after the island is submerged, after forest fires have burned through half a state. Even then, we don't do remotely enough. 
people continue to flock to the coasts, to places that are going to be severely affected by climate change. Even those who believe that climate change is real tell themselves, it won't affect me. I'll sell my home near the sea before it's too late. Normandy talk helps such denial. It allows us to imagine that if we all made just a few more sacrifices, there is a way to prevent catastrophe. Now, to be clear, there is a compelling scientific and moral case to be made for mitigation. The less carbon we emit, the more we can delay the harmful consequences of climate change. Some significant harms from climate change are already inevitable. The things we do today can have an enormous impact on the lives of people 100, 200, or 500 years from now. The truth is, we shouldn't have to choose between adaptation and mitigation. They are both important. We must save millions of people around the world who will be displaced or affected by climate change in the near future. And we must limit the planetary harm we pass down to future generations. As Christina told me, we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. But across the world, governments are not doing remotely enough on either front, let alone both. Meanwhile, the storms and fires and floods keep coming. To paraphrase that warning on the side view mirrors of cars, the future is closer than you think. Hidden Brain is produced by Hidden Brain Media 